So let's bow our heads. Uh, dear Father God, thank you again for this opportunity, Lord, to study and learn your word, Lord, and learn how to defend our faith. But Lord, more importantly, we're here today because of a destructive hurricane that has, uh, it has entered uh, the United States the second one in two weeks. Lord, use this opportunity to show your mercy, Lord, to show your compassion. And Lord, also to show your love through your people as they do kingdom work, showing compassion, help, care, missionary work, and Lord, to spread the gospel in times of need, in times of calamity. Get these people back on our feet, Lord. Bless them and show them that you are the way through adversity and through bad times. And that comes through us as your children, your children of God. We pray that in your most precious name. Amen. All right. So fate of the apostles. Um, this is based on, I uh, forgot to put it up on the screen. Um, this book right here, Fate of the Apostles by Sean McDowell. Uh, it's on Amazon. It's a pretty, it's a pretty easy read. It's actually from his PhD dissertation. Um, he gets real, real, he drills down a lot into academia sources uh, that you can also look up on the internet. But Sean, you may recognize his name, his famous father, Josh McDowell. So Sean was one of my professors in Old Testament um, theology and also in defense of the resurrection. Uh, he has become an expert on the apostles' lives and martyrdom. Um, Barry and I have tried to get Sean down in Louisiana to do a one of Barry's breakfasts, but uh, he seems to be a busy talking circuit now. And I think, Barry, the pandemic kind of uh, put a kilter on that as well. But nonetheless, we'll still try to work on him to get him down to Louisiana. He's a, he's a dynamic speaker, uh, and he's a great apologist and theologian. Okay, so better the apostles. Uh, unfortunately, very little is known about the apostles as a whole, uh, the original 12, and especially the one who replaced Judas, uh, Matthias. Hardly anything's known about him. So Sean does a great job of collating, researching to find out what happened to the original uh, 12. We know what happened to Judas, but the other 11. And then we'll also talk about some of the first martyrs that we find in the book of Acts, um, who ironically were not the original 11 apostles. I say 11 because I take Judas out because we know Judas committed suicide, and we told that in the Gospels. So a little background on the 12 apostles. Um, so the apostles went through a rigorous, a rigorous Old Testament type of rabbi training. Uh, we don't have time to get into what that training entailed, but it usually started when kids were eight, nine years old. I guess a lot of us are used to especially in the Catholic schools I went to, you had to go to Bible school on Sundays, uh, learn about Noah and Daniel and the lions and all the cute Bible stories that we were taught back then. But rabbi training for these kids in, in, uh, in Palestine wasn't exactly that type of easy kind of storytelling. We're talking about hard memory, reading of scripture, um, debating, Socratic debates between teacher and student. I mean, this was this was hardcore theological training. So what Jesus is doing is taking these, for the most part, illiterate, most of them were illiterate, we think, and training them not only to be literate in scripture, but to be trained to be an evangelist, and to be trained to be as just as learned as any rabbi at the time. The greatest teacher you can have, obviously. So when you read through the Gospels and you see the, um, the analogy to that training, 
we're looking at a hardcore type of teaching that Jesus is having with these guys. And that's why Jesus says, follow me, leave everything else behind, because that's exactly what a rabbi student would do. It was essentially, this is 100% of your life, is going to learn Old Testament scripture, theology, and God gives them a new mandate, is to evangelize not only to the house of Israel, but now to the world. So what we see is a very important transition, a very important link between the ministry of Jesus to the first and early church that we see in the book of Acts. Now, Jesus ascends to heaven. So these guys, these guys are going to be the direct connection, the direct link. Now, if they fail on their mission, then Christianity fails. Now, we're also going to include Paul in this grouping, and he was not an original apostle. We can call him a disciple. He becomes probably the greatest evangelist that we've seen the world has ever known. So we're going to collectively put Paul into this group when we talk about apostles or disciples at large. So what we have here is, is a small group of people who, if they fail in their mission, then Christianity fails, and we're not here talking about our faith. We're not here talking about Jesus Christ. So if you can imagine that mandate and that incredible burden that happens, it's a miracle, literally, that Christianity becomes the most dominant religion in the world today. And it just so happens, we'll see a map. It so happens at a time of history to where we have an empire that's relatively at peace, we have an empire that has the best road system in the world. So therefore, you could travel quite easily, quite cheaply. I've actually driven on some of those roads that were built during the time of Christ. So that's pretty amazing that God places Paul at the right time, at the right place, not coincidence, to spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire, a hostile empire to the new budding Christians. So remember, the Romans at this time are tolerating other religions. They have a pagan religious system. They tolerated Judaism. We see that with Pilate. We see that with the colony, well, the territory of Palestine that the Romans have conquered. They're tolerating Jewish worship. But what happens is that the first Christians, the very first Christians that we'll see become martyrs, aren't considered Christians per se. They're considered a corrupted sect. They're, they're considered a corrupted sect of Judaism. And it's not so much the Romans who are the antagonists, antagonists or they're the Jews antagonizing the Romans to arrest and to execute the early Christians considered rogue Jewish believers. So that's kind of the petri dish that's going on with the apostles right now. They're like a man without a country and a man without a religion. So their job is cut out for them. So the, the first Christian martyrs, first Christian martyrs. I have John the Baptist with a question mark, and I have Stephen and a lot, you know, a lot of people forget Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So what is a martyr? What is the definition of a martyr? Well, it comes from the Greek word, and it means a witness. It's Greek for witness, um, testimony. So going into a trial court and giving a sworn testimony that is based on the truth, based on the truth. And that becomes important when we talk about Christian martyrs. So what is a Christian martyr definition. Well, the easiest and the best definition that usually is used amongst biblical scholars is going to be one whose testimony for Jesus results in death. One that, one whose testimony for Jesus Christ results in death. And so what would happen is that when the Roman Empire starts to 
define the first Christian movements, not only becoming a breakaway of Judaism, but now they're praying to a monotheistic God and to Jesus Christ. That becomes a political problem, and that becomes a political dynamic that the Romans need to squash. So then we see Roman emperors, prefects, come in and use that test. Do you profess your allegiance, your faith in Jesus Christ or Caesar or Apollo, et cetera, et cetera? And if they say no to Jesus Christ, well, then that becomes treason. So that's the test that starts with Nero. We'll see that. We have Nero, Domitian, it goes on and on. We'll talk about some of those guys. But that becomes a standard test. Either profess your faith to Jesus Christ and or to Caesar. Because remember, at this time, Caesars are considered a god, if not the head god. All right, so John the Baptist. Was John the Baptist, so under that definition, does John the Baptist become a martyr? Well, if you remember scripture, John the Baptist was jailed because he started to chastise, he started to go after Herod, Antipas, because of his marriage to his cousin. I mean, I'm sorry, not his cousin, to his niece. Not John the Baptist's niece, but Herod's niece. So John the Baptist is jailed. And if you know the story in scripture, what happens is that the daughter of Herod's niece comes to dance in front of Herod, and he she does a provocative dance, and Herod goes to her and says, I'll give you anything up to half my kingdom. And then his niece, well, his new niece, right? No, his new daughter-in-law, it's confusing, goes to the mother the yeah. wife, and says, tell him, that I want his head, John the Baptist's head on a platter. We know the rest of the story. John the Baptist is executed because of that promise to um, to the daughter whose name was um, Salome, I think, Salome. Nonetheless, John the Baptist, I think, definitely would have been a martyr if asked, do you profess your faith to Jesus Christ? So technically, John the Baptist not, would not be a martyr under that definition, but a martyr nonetheless. Now, Stephen... Now, the first Christian martyr becomes Stephen. We need to spend some time on Stephen here, because through Steve, Stephen's martyrdom, we get some of the most incredible theological ramifications of the difference between Mosaic law and the new covenant through Jesus Christ. And, and a guy named Douglas Moo, Douglas Moo is probably one of the best respected, well-known New Testament theologians. And he specializes in Mosaic nice. law, how it applies to us Christians. And as you well know, there's a huge debate. I had a debate yesterday with a young man about the application of Mosaic law, right, to the Christian. And there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of um, miscommunication. There's a lot of misunderstanding on those two theological systems or two covenants. We live under the new covenant. And through Stephen's defense in Acts, let me get to it. I think it's Acts chapter. Someone can help me out here. Acts, is it Acts? Is it seven? Seven. Seven. It's seven. Acts seven. seven. Um we can't, I wish I could spend a whole hour just on this, but nonetheless, Stephen goes through this incredible Old Testament narrative. And, 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 he's, and he's in defense because what's happened is that Stephen has been accused of mocking not only the temple, but mocking Moses, Joseph, and the patriarchs, and the Mosaic law. But Stephen is not doing that. Stephen is trying to show this transition between Mosaic law into the new covenant that's incorporated in the cup, the suffering cup of Jesus Christ. And Douglas Moo said it beautifully. And Douglas Moo sums up Stephen's defense and martyrdom 
this way. Yes. So through Stephen's defense, we find that the law was temporary. The law pronounces a curse on everything, on everyone, I'm sorry, on everyone who fails to keep it in its entirety. Now, remember the Pharisees and the Sadducees and other and other pontificates. Of course, I use that word in archaic matter because there's no pontiff back then, but nonetheless, they thought adherence, strict adherence to the Ten Commandments, being a son of Abraham, got you into the kingdom of God. That got you in. And that's why they're pointing their fingers at everyone and saying, you know, if you're not of Abraham or if you don't follow the Ten Commandments and listen to us, how we're the ones who apply it, then you're not into the kingdom of God. So the law pronounces a curse on everyone who fails to keep it in its entirety. But God provided a way of escape. The law was given for a time to convince men of their inability to fulfill the will of God and to leave them with no option except to embrace Jesus Christ. So the law points to the coming of a Messiah because there is not one living person on the face of this earth who ever lived on the face of the earth who could have completely, 100% followed the Ten Commandments in their head or in their heart. Because remember, on the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus makes that point. Is that, whoa, 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 wait, wait. Just because you're following the Ten Commandments, you think you're following the Ten Commandments to a T. If you look at a woman down the street, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously, if you look at a woman down the street, you lust after her, that's a sin. That's a sin. So it's also in your heart and in your mind. So the only way that we can be saved through inerrant thoughts or sin that we'd anger and and, and and jealousy, those are all sins. The only way we can be saved through that is through this new covenant through Jesus Christ. So what does Stephen really show us? And number one that progress and change are within God's program. Progress and change are within God's program. And we see that through the Mosaic law being morphed into and changed into the embodiment, literally, in Jesus Christ. So the Ten Commandments get watered down to two commandments, love God and love your neighbor. That's essentially a percolation down to the Ten Commandments into two. And that's why Jesus espoused that. Jesus used Old Testament Mosaic law as examples. We see that in marriage, right? We see that in sexual morality with Paul's epistles. And number two, the blessings of God are not limited. This is important. The blessings of God are not limited to land of Israel and the temple area. And that's what got Stephen stoned. That's what got Stephen Stone. He's like, no, no, no. This temple, this temple that behind me here, guys, you think that God is housed. You're keeping God in a box, you Pharisees and you Sadducees and others. You're keeping God in a box. And he quotes Isaiah 66. And Isaiah 66, of course, you know, God is not kept within just a house. His footstool is the earth. You know, God... God is, God is meant to be accessible to everyone. That's why the curtain gets torn down to the Holy of Holies, right? The Holy of Holies in the temple at the time of Jesus' death. That's a symbolic, that's a symbolic rendering of now the temple is open to everyone. Now, I get pushback from some other theologians. It doesn't really mean that, but I'm here to tell you that the majority of biblical scholars um, will tell you that that is the symbolic act that happens because it also demonstrates that the second temple is no longer an accessible fraternity house for the Pharisees and Sadducees and people who thought that they were in with God. And that's what gets Stephen in trouble. He blasphemes the temple, 
And ironically, about 40 years later, the temple gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. The temple gets destroyed. So the blessings of God are not limited to the land of Israel, but everyone outside the temple area, we have Yom Kippur that's coming up. Is it, is it this Friday? Or I think it's this week, right? Anyway, Yom Kippur was the one day that the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies and utter the name of God. And it actually had to tie him with a rope so we can go in and try to pull him back if anything happened. Very, very fascinating um, story when you when you read that whole that whole dynamic there. But nonetheless, now it's open to everyone. And that's why the Great Commission is so important. And that's why the apostles become so important. Because these are the guys going out spreading the word of God beyond the temple. Beyond it. They, they, they are the temple. And that's why Jesus said he was the temple. And Jesus is available to everyone. So the temple now becomes you know, in our churches. The temple now becomes people like Billy Graham. The temple becomes us this morning learning about the new covenant in Jesus Christ. So going back to a couple of months ago, someone asked why the New Testament had to be written um, down. Why it wasn't just kept in the oral tradition? Well, of course, obviously, so we could learn about the life and times and the new covenant of Jesus Christ. But remember, God required all covenants to be written down. God required all covenants to be written down. So the new covenant, the life and times of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ's ministry, Jesus Christ as Lord God, Jesus Christ as our Savior, becomes written down as a new covenant. So one reason we know that this is a bona fide covenant, it's the new covenant of Jesus Christ, the one end all, the one covenant that has been worked up to until Genesis. Until And in Genesis 3, Genesis 3, we see the crimson thread being run through until Revelation, the crimson thread being the suffering of Christ. And that's going to be the that's going to be the theme of the apostles' life is that, hey, you're going to have to walk in Jesus' shoes, and you're going to have to emulate Jesus Christ throughout your own mission work. Not only in Jerusalem, but in Samaria, in North Africa, in Syria, in the rest of Rome. And we're going to see in Ethiopia, parts of present-day Russia, probably in India, in Spain. So we're starting to see, and that's part of the new, that's part of the known world at that time. So this mandate it would have been easy just to be in Jerusalem because at least you got a concentration of new Christians coming in who could kind of watch each other's backs. But now we're having these apostles going out with nothing other than their faith in Jesus Christ. And they're and they know they could be killed, they could be executed, they could be thrown in jail because. Jesus, that's what happened to Jesus Christ. So the third thing about Stephen's defense is Israel in the past always, always evidenced a pattern against God. A pattern against God. Worship God, throw God out the window, start worshiping Moloch and start worshiping Baal. And we see that no only with the population, but with their kings, and that's one of the reasons that God did not want the Israelites to intermarry, intermingle with these pagan societies, because he knows he knew what would happen through his foreknowledge, obviously, and it did happen. So Israel in its past always evidenced a pattern of opposition to God's plans and his people. 
So the new covenant has to be implemented. So not, not only is Stephen saying the Mosaic law, the temple are no longer the confines of God and no longer you Sadducees and Pharisees, the, 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 the purple, the purple, excuse me, I can't even talk this morning. I can't talk this morning. The perpetuals of the actual theological construct. No, no longer do you get to confine us in that. Now we have the availability of Jesus Christ as the new covenant, who is the temple, by the way. And that gets him killed. And that gets him killed. And obviously we have Jesus Christ being the ultimate sacrifice, the perfect sheep, the perfect lamb that gets slaughtered basically for no reason. Remember, Pilate, Pilate wanted to let Jesus go for the same reasons that Festus and Agrippa told Paul in the book of Acts, I can't find anything wrong with this guy. I'm talking about Paul. Festus, remember, is the one who is trying to get Paul before Agrippa, does get him before Agrippa, King Agrippa. And they both ultimately find out that Paul's not really doing anything against the Roman Empire per se, it was the Jews who were getting agitated by Paul's teachings, who are complaining that Paul is a dissenter. He's desecrating the temples here. Um, we need to get rid of him. So Agrippa, as you may recall from Acts, I think chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, I believe. Agrippa says, Paul, you almost have me convinced Paul's actually telling the same story that Stephen did in his defense of the new covenant. The first apologist, by the way. And Paul does such a great job. He says, Agrippa, Agrippa, you should know this. You should know about Jesus' ministry. And Agrippa doesn't deny it. Agrippa does not deny the creed of Jesus Christ. What Agrippa says to Paul, and you may recall this, is that Man, you almost had me convinced, but sorry, you went ahead and invoked Caesar to judge you. So you got to go see Caesar. The point of the story, the moral of the story, is that these men weren't doing anything wrong, yet they get killed because of their faith in one man who happens to be God, by the way. Jesus Christ. So what's the, think about the irony of that. The irony of that. So Jesus goes willingly because he knew he had to go, right? And that's part of his, that's part of his deity to fulfill the salvation plan. Yet we see him suffering greatly. So the moral there is that in order to achieve mortality and achieve oneness and holiness with God the Father, we have to suffer. And these apostles at first didn't get it, but they got it after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus had to go through six trials, six different trials, three civil, three religious. And finally, it wasn't Pilate or the Roman authorities that technically put Jesus to death. It was the Jews. The same Jews who put Stephen to death. Okay, um, let's get now to the apostles. The centrality of the, oh, questions, comments. Um, so what made these 11, and Matthias makes 12, what makes these apostles all of a sudden turn from, I don't get this whole messianic message of, my sins are forgiven through a man-God, through this hypostatic union of Jesus being man and God, 100% man, 100% God. You know, why? No, they're looking more at a, at, at a King David type of archetype or mold. What made them from not getting it to getting it? Well, the centrality of the resurrection and the empty tomb. And we see Paul talk about that one Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, 
throughout this series I've been teaching, that is the fundam fundamental Christian creed. And we won't belabor it too much more, but the resurrection is the heart of the earliest Christian kerygma from pre-biblical creeds to the apostolic, apostolic fathers. Kerygma is a, is a Greek term for meaning creed. You know, Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose again. Pretty simple. And the resurrection demonstrates his deity and demonstrates the power of God and demonstrates his messianic mandate to save us from our sins through the suffering of Jesus Christ. Okay, so these guys were to witness to a risen Jesus. They got the creed, they got the skin on the wall. For the most part, the 12 apostles were Galileans, but after the resurrection, they remained in Jerusalem to proclaim the risen Jesus. They didn't go back to their homes. Now we think, some scholars think, Peter may have gone back to Galilee, but he came back in full force. But nonetheless, they stayed in the lion's den, quite literally. They're still being hunted down. We read they're hiding out in upper rooms and hiding out in other rooms. But they know now they're emboldened. Something emboldened them to the brink of knowing if they get caught, they could be a martyr. And we saw what martyrdom means. They understood and accepted the basic meaning of the risen Savior. Otherwise, they would have not engaged in a missionary work under threat of persecution. And that persecution was mighty. Now, the persecution doesn't happen as we think, you know, the gladiator games or being fed to the lions or being burned alive. We see in Nero, Nero comes on about late 50s to 60s AD, the real threat of persecution for the first apostles um, doesn't start until about 44 AD. And we see um, we see Herod, the, uh, another Herod come in and start to round up these new Christians and that's when we see the apostles starting to leave Jerusalem. Um, that's about the time, maybe about 50, 52 AD, we see James being, being killed. We see James being killed. And we're going to talk about him in a couple of minutes. The persecution really ramps up under Nero. And uh, we all know the famous, um, some people say it's, it's a mythological story. There's new archaeological evidence now that it probably was close to the truth that the infamous fire of Rome, Nero blamed on the Christians, and that gave him a reason to go out, hunt them down, burn them alive. And there are stories about Christians actually being burned on, his, on, on sticks and actually lighting the Roman parapets or the gates of Rome. Um, it's probably a hyperbole, but nonetheless, there is substantial evidence that Nero did start an incredible, um, not genocide, but close to a genocide of, of Christians. And then, of course, that morphs into, um, then we see, we see emperors such as um, Diocletian and Domitian. So from about 100 AD to the time of Constantine, we have Diocletian, we have Domitian, and a couple others who are making it part of their part of their mandate to round up Christians and start to execute and kill them. And that's when we start seeing people like Justin Martyr. I'm not sure if you heard of Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr is one of the early church fathers who was martyred. And at first, when I started studying, I thought martyrdom came from Justin Martyr. It's spelled the same way. No, no, it just happens that Justin Martyr's last name is the same name as Martyr in Greek. Um, so Justin Martyr becomes one of the best known martyrs during this time. Clement of Rome and other church fathers were also um, put to death 
this way. And remember that test of martyrdom, you, if you profess your allegiance, your faith in Jesus Christ and no other Roman God, that was the test to put you to death. And um, we see that happen a lot right now. What was the infamous, oh, that infamous scene we saw several years ago where we saw ISIS kill those uh, Coptic Christians? Was it North Africa, I think, in any event? That was the test. Do you profess your loyalty and, 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 and allegiance and faith in Jesus Christ, and not Muhammad or not Allah? And uh, they were beheaded. Um, that is a map of the known Roman Empire at the time or the height of the apostles going out to evangelize. So we see Britain up there, England, obviously. We see North Africa. So ironically, the birth of Christianity really starts to take hold in North Africa. Mapmex St. Augustine is from North Africa. In Syria, present-day Syria, and then present-day Turkey. So that area outside of Jerusalem, Jerusalem becomes a hotbed of Christian persecution, starting around 44, 45 AD. So we see that spreading of Christianity. So actually, you know, the Herods did us a favor because they forced out a lot of these apostles to go out and evangelize. Now, Paul is going through most of the Mediterranean, right, at a time, at a time that's actually a little bit before the 12 apostles go out to evangelize. So amongst them all, we have this whole area right here covered. Now, Spain is in the red there because it's part of the Roman Empire. Some of you may have read stories about Paul evangelizing in Spain. Um, that hasn't been authenticated completely yet. Do I think he went there? Yeah, I think maybe he may made it into Spain, but there's no indication of it in the book of Acts or his epistles. Nonetheless, it doesn't matter because Christianity spreads not only through this red part, but as we do know, by early third, early fourth century, Constantine makes this whole area in red, makes it the whole area red. Christianity is now a tolerated religion. Now there's some, there's this misconception that Constantine, I think in 313 AD, um, made Christianity the official religion of the empire. No, not yet. He made it tolerable. He made it one of the religions that are to be recognized. Remember, there's a lot of pagan religions going on right now. The Romans were, that's one of the reasons the Romans were so successful in their empire ship. They would go into a territory they conquered and they would allow the people to assimilate into their empire, into their culture, but they would tolerate, they would let those people practice their own religion. Because for the most part, they weren't any type of threat to the Roman political system. And then we have the Christians come aboard and they start to become not only a religious threat, but a political threat because their allegiance is not to a Caesar. Their allegiance is to Jesus Christ to Jesus Christ. About 380 AD is when Christianity becomes the official, the official religion of the Roman Empire. And at, and thank God, because about 410, 412 AD, and here's the irony of how God's plan works, is barbarians come in from the north and they invade Rome, and through a process of years, the Roman Empire falls. Well, guess what the barbarians bring back to their homelands, and they start to spread out. What's the official language of the Roman Empire when the barbarians come in? Christianity. So then we see why countries that develop from the barbarian territories in Spain and in Portugal and in France, become devout Christian nations. 
and we won't talk about the Greek Orthodox Church. It's, it's, it, I call it Catholic light. But nonetheless, this whole area becomes Catholic, not just through Roman edicts, but through barbarian evangel evangelistic teachings. And to me, that's just fascinating. So what's the um what's the analysis so what's the analysis used for the construct of how the apostles lived and how they were martyred? Well, Sean uses this type of of um formula. He uses the living memory. And that means he uses sources up to about 190 AD. And what does that what exactly does that mean? Well, number one. Peter and his contemporary associates assumably died roughly A.D. 80. A.D. 80. Now, we do, we think that Paul, since we get the gospel of Paul at about 90, so Paul probably lives to about 90, 91 A.D. And that's within, that's within a plausible lifetime of an apostle of Jesus Christ. So sources up to 190 AD, that's kind of that first tier. And we do have a lot of resources, especially in the book of Acts, as we as we know, of Peter and of John to a certain extent. The second living memory tier is going to be direct followers of the apostles. Okay. And we see that with people like Polycarp and Papias. They were disciples of John. And fortunately, we have a lot of their letters, a lot of their writings that mandate and that tell us and that demonstrate and kind of put a rubber stamp on, yes, what Paul, I mean, sorry, what John was writing in his gospel and his epistles is true, is accurate. So we have extra biblical early church father, actually disciples of disciples, we had their sources to fall back on. And finally, so that generation would have died out about 135 AD. So the disciples of the apostles, those guys would have died out about 135 AD. And the third tier that works into this living memory um, is the second generation, the, apostles, the disciples of the disciples of the apostles. And they would have died out about 200 AD. So that 190 AD comes to 200. That's what's considered the living memory and ancient sources. So what else do we use to find out about the apostles' lives? Early church fathers, um, Clement of Rome, Origen, Justin Martyr. So um, Ignatius, all these guys kept copious writings and books and, and reflections, not only on scripture, but on the apostles themselves. Not, not, not all the apostles now. And we're going to go through a survey of apostle through apostle through apostle, probably next week, make it into Peter today. So again, even though there's a paucity, very little source information within the Bible itself, but we also look to what's called um, pseudepigraphal, pseudepigraphal books and letters. What the heck does pseudepigraphal mean, Scott? Well, it's just a fancy Greek work for books or writings that we're not sure who the authors were. Okay, So if a book or a writing or a scroll comes in front of the early church fathers or one of the early councils, and if they could not authenticate the author of the book or work, it does not make it within the canon of the Bible. Okay. But nonetheless, scholars have to go to those books and letters to at least maybe piece together and kind of put a puzzle together of the lives of the apostles. But you need to do it very carefully because some of it's corrupted, but some of it may not be. And that's so the work. How do you spell that word? So P S E U D E P I G R A P H like like pseudo like pseudo. There you go. That's right. Anonymously, we don't know really who authored it, and if it if we didn't know who authored the book, 
then it doesn't make it to the canon. By the way, someone sent me a, an email. I need to respond to it about this issue, the can canonicity of scripture. And to digress a little bit, last week, I unfortunately started to bleed through into discussions on the canon of the Bible and translations of the Bible. But what I was really, the focus of that presentation from last week, if you can recall, was really on the authenticity, textual criticism of the New Testament. So I, 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 I need to do, and I can do, if you guys want later on, a presentation on the canon of the Bible, canon Greek word for measuring stick or a ruler. How did the books of the Bible that we have today make it into this codex? Remember a codex being a bound book. Um, and then a separate, a separate distinct subject are translations of the Bible. And I do want to put an asterisk on that because I started to really chastise and, and, and lambast the NLT, the New Living Translation. There's a time and place. It's a, para, it's a paraphrase Bible. Um, it's not the NSAB. It's not the King James, but the King James are more formal Bibles. We'll, we'll do a presentation on biblical translations, which is different from the canon of the Bible and different from biblical authenticity. So I just wanted to throw that in there because the, pseudo, the pseudepigraphal books are part of that debate of what books go in the Bible, what don't. And then you have the sub, the sub section debate within the canonicity of the Bible between the Catholic Bible, usually the Dewey Reims translation, and the Protestant Bible, NSAB, King James Bible. As some of you guys will know, there's between seven to nine books in the Catholic Bible, even in the later editions of the Septuagint, that are not in our Bible. I don't have time right now to get into the reasons why, but there's a good reason that the reformers didn't carry those other books in the Old Testament into this Bible. And one guy asked me that, and I'll answer him directly before the weekend, I promise. Okay, going on to this. The other sources, Tacitus and Josephus, we've met these two guys before. Tacitus being a Roman, a Roman politician, historian, and a lawyer. Josephus being a Jewish slash Roman historian. Fortunately, we get a lot of information of the apostles from these two guys as well. Now, the New Testament Apocrypha, New Testament Apocrypha, which fit into the pseudo pickerful books and letters that we see up there. And this is where it gets interesting, guys. And I'm not sure if you read Dan Brown's um, uh, The Da Vinci Code. But the Da Vinci Code is basically based on these guys. The Gospel of Thomas. Did you guys know there's a Gospel of Thomas? There's a Gospel of Peter. There's a Gospel of Bartholomew. There's a Gospel of Philip. There's an Acts of Andrew, an Acts of John, an Acts of Paul, and on and on and on. There's actually a Gospel and an Acts of Mary. I said, oh my gosh, why didn't these make it into the canon of the Bible that we know today, that we read today? Well, the number one reason is, again, it's a pseudo pigraphal book, meaning we don't really know if Thomas or if Peter or Bartholomew wrote these gospels or these books. And, and furthermore, they're dated way beyond the 190 AD that you see up there. But what I want to do is read to you is read to you from, see if I can find it here. I had it noted here. It's, it's actually sort of funny if you didn't know any better. So in the, in the gospel or on the, the Acts of John, the Acts of John, I can't find my notes, but I know it, I can, I can paraphrase it. The Acts of John, there's actually a narrative where John is sleeping and is getting woken up by bedbugs. And John, John orders the bedbugs, yeah, bedbugs like we have in our beds, orders the bedbugs to get out of his bed 
and scatter away and don't and don't bother her anymore in the name of Jesus. The next morning, John gets up and the bed bugs are all lined up at the front door to be let out. And John lets the bed bugs out. And that's supposed to be one of the miracles. So, you know, that, that kind of bends the authenticity of what we see in the true gospels. And then the gospel of, of and this is gospel of Andrew. Andrew is evangelizing somewhere, probably either in India or present day Nepal. And a leopard approaches him and a companion and wants to eat them. And the leopard is talking and is th doing a theological discourse with him. And he commands a leopard to leave and not consume him. And that's just two of the most fantastic stories that we see in these apocryphal books. And it gets, it actually gets more and more bizarre. Now, now, that's not to say that these apocryphal books don't have some references that we see in the Gospels. But those type of narrative stories tend to corrupt the authenticity that we see displayed in the four Gospels that we have in our Bible. So we could spend a whole hour just talking about those books. And you can go online. Go, you can go online and just type in apocryphal books, fantastic stories, and you'll see all these um, references to these stories that I just told you. Okay, what's the scale for evaluating the historical evidence that we're going to get into? How do we know that what we're about to learn, hopefully in the next five minutes and then next week, is is authentic? In other words, how do we know that? Sean and other scholars aren't taking stories about the apostles from these apocryphal books that, Scott, you just told me some are beyond comprehension or sound kind of silly. Well, we're going to give it a kind of scale. So not possibly true, certainly not historical, very probably not true, doubtly historical, Improbable, unlikely, less plausible than not, slightly less possible than not. As plausible as not, plausible. And as you see, you go on and on to the highest possible probability, nearly historically certain. So as we go through the survey of each apostle, including Paul, we're going to be using this type of scale based on Scripture, what we have in our Bible, on early church fathers' letters and writings, which are authentic and are reliable. Now, unfortunately, we have to use extra-biblical sources such as Apocrypha because, because we don't have that much information to back up the stories that we've learned through church, through sermons, through campfire stories of these apostles. So we need to carefully, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, and each piece, even though it may not fit, or for that matter, fit, has to be vetted out to make sure that it authentically fits, or at least fits in with this construct of scale. So if you get maybe in the middle, down to the bottom, as plausible as not so plausible to nearly historically certain, you're working within the confines of a historical, it probably happened. Before that, no, there's no, there's no reliable evidence that the story of this apostle is true. So bottom half of the scale probably happened. Top half of the scale is probably one of those stories we see about the bed bugs and the leper. Okay, so using that scale, we're going to go through, and at the bottom of each apostle, I'm going to give you the evaluation that scholars have accorded. So it's 927, and so before we get into Peter, 
I'm going to save that for next week. So now we are going to go through a apostle by apostle survey, and we are going to debunk and we are going to authenticate some of the narratives and some of the stories, some of the information we may have about the apostles, some right, some wrong. So before we launch into Peter, um, like for instance, Peter cru crucified upside down in Rome. Uh, there's a huge debate of whether or not it really happened. Um, I'll just give you a little, uh, so look on the bottom there. Next week, we're gonna start in earnest of Peter, but highest possible probability that Peter was martyred the way that we've been taught upside down on a cross. So that's kind of the scale we're we'll be going through. So before we uh, before we get into that next week, I guess we have a couple of minutes for questions, comments. Hey, hey Scott, you mentioned uh, where, where Christianity was at the time, uh, present day Turkey, Russia, Spain. Um, you mentioned France real quickly. I know you said Portugal. Where, where else was? The Christian faith at that time, right, right then. You mean at the time at the, well, at the time that Paul's missionary journeys that that yes there was no so Christianity doesn't really start to take off as far as a bona fide religious system until probably Constantine, right, three third the early fourth century. It's recognized. You know, we have a pope now ensconced in Rome, so that's why it's called Roman. Catholicism, right? So to answer your question, that doesn't really happen until maybe 250 years, 270 years after these first apostles start to go out to evangelize. Um, so that's actually a but, good question. But it was present day Turkey, parts of Russia, Spain, Portugal. Sure. I mean, uh, those, countries were, those countries were Christian until the Ottoman Empire comes in. So remember, Muhammad comes on in the 8th century. And that's when you start to see the most, the new Islamic religion looked at Christianity the same way the Romans did, you know, centuries before. So then you start to see Muhammad gobble up. I mean, remember, I mean, parts, parts of Arabia were Christian until Islam comes on as the second largest religion. So, um, yeah, so those I mean, so parts of what well, you just said, it parts of what? Parts of Arabia. You just said so, yeah, I mean, so so parts of the Persian Empire. Now, part I'm saying parts become tolerant of Christians, right? So what happens is that so on this map here, Islam, right? The Persian Empire, Arabia down there where the Israelites did their 40 years. Um, Christianity is starting to flourish in there. Christianity is starting to flourish in North Africa. But then the Islam empire comes on and they start to invade, take over ancient Near East. All that red you see on the right side of your screen. And then they take over North Africa, the Moors. Remember the Moors? The Moors take over North Africa and they're kicking Christianity out. So that happens about 700 years, 650 to 700 years after maybe the death of Peter. So... There was a strong foothold that starts now to get quashed. Now, now we're starting to see mission fields go back out into these areas that originally were the first Christians. And that's kind of the, the irony of what, of what goes on in history. So, but there's a reason why the whole area that we see of Western Europe was called the Holy Roman oh, Empire. No, no, my mother taught me... Uh, Catholic Church means the universal church versus the Roman Catholic Church. Catholicism means a universal system. And thank God literally for Catholic explorers. Remember Columbus, Columbus, 1492, he sailed the ocean blue. Columbus believed being a devout Christian Columbus believed he was fulfilling prophecy, going out and discovering the new world. 
That was a relig more of a religious mandate than it was a political uh, mandate. And don't get me wrong, Ferdinand and Isabella and then uh, all the other explorers and kings and queens and, and, and emperors, yes, they wanted to expand their empire and find gold and precious jewels. I understand that. But nonetheless, the impetus here is a Christian mandate that Columbus and other Magellan the same way. Remember I told you how the book that Darwin wrote isn't per se just about natural selection. Darwin had a religious bone to pick. And it was very uh, racist. And very racist. But anyway, so um, the Catholicism starts to grow incredibly after Constantine. And as I said, the barbarians, you call them barbarians, most of them weren't really barbarian per se. Um, but in any event, they're the ones who really, really spread Christianity. Um, I mean, you look at a lot of, there are a lot of Viking tribes that weren't into Nordic mythology. A lot of them were Christians. A lot of them were Christians. They take, the Vikings are the ones who come down the Seine River in about 870, 900 AD, maybe a little earlier. They sail up the Seine and they get evangelized and they spread Christianity more than the actual first Christians there. Charlemagne, Charlemagne being a barbarian, Charlemagne was a devout Christian who helped spread Christianity. You know, but I, the problem is a lot of this doesn't get taught in schools um, because there's this Ooh, religious Christian slant there. I mean, if it weren't if it weren't for Charles Martel and others, Western Europe, a devout Christian warrior, Western Europe probably be Islam now. I mean, go on and on and on and on and on. But in any, in any event, it's just it's just amazing how God set the timing up to have Paul and the first apostles evangelize in a relatively easy way because. The Roman Empire was set up for it. At this time, the Roman Empire is generally at peace, right? The Carthaginian Wars are over. The Greek Wars are over because Roman legions defeated them, ultimately. The road system that we have, so ship journeys were precarious and the most dangerous way to travel in the ancient world. Read what Paul went through, right, in the book of Acts. So the easiest, cheapest way was to walk or at least have mules. Or if you were rich or if you were a Roman citizen, you could have a horse. Okay. So it was ripe to have the first evangelistic missions go out into this world. And then, of course, Constantine makes it one of the official religions. It's like, it's just amazing how God uses, I mean, God uses history, of course, but when you look back at biblical history and what we're learning right now, it's just, it's set up just so perfectly. It's God's plan. Now, um, he's got to work through human free will. And I, and I believe, and I teach, that's one of the reasons Jesus Christ had to go through six different trials. I mean, God could have put him on the cross very easily, but it took six trials to get Jesus on that cross. Uh, it took the, the 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 wicked plan of Judas, you know, and actually scripture tells us that was the plan. Jesus knew that was the plan. Mm -hmm. All right. So I don't want to keep you guys too much longer. Good questions. Um, so next week we will start with Peter and go apostle by apostle by apostle. Um, some of the information you probably already know, some of it's going to be new because Sean actually found some fascinating um new research that really sheds light more on the martyrism. I, say, I keep saying martyrism, the martyr, martyrdom, martyrdom of the first apostles, which by the way becomes a, becomes a blueprint and an expectation for our lives, right? I know a lot of new Christians come online and this is gonna be a day of wine and roses. I'm good with God. You know, everything's hunky-dory, the prosperity gospel. When you go through the lives of the apostles, no, you got to emulate Christ and pick up his cross. He tells us to do that. Pick up your cross and follow me. And we're going to read a couple of biblical passages on that next week. 
All right, guys. Hey, um, Scott. 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 Um, may I caution you in using the word Palestine when you speak about an area during Jesus' lifetime? Uh, I have been very interested in when the term Palestine came to be used as an area or as a country. I encourage all of y'all not gaslighted on the word Palestine, which nowadays is a very anti-Semitic, anti-Israeli term. So when you are tempted to use the word Palestine, I ask you to check your history, check your understanding of when was the word Palestine first used. I can't find it in the Bible. It it's may be all, in maps, um, but not so, as a a designated country. So, um, so right. So Collins, unfortunately, and you're right. In this, in this, in this political atmosphere we have right now, I know it's kind of a four-letter word when it comes to Jewish history. But I actually did some research on this years ago. Palestine actually is the root of it comes from Philistine, mm -hmm. Philistines, mm -hmm. um, who were a Semitic people, by the way. That's the root. But that's the root. Now there yes, are, I understand that. There, there are some references uh, of the Romans using the word Palestine. But in recent history, the Brits, the British are the ones who really, really use that term Palestine as a geographic type of area, not so much as an ethnic type of tag or or or, or formal name. But you're right. And, and, and I try to use ancient Near East, um, but Palestine can invoke, Collins, exactly what you were warning against. And actually that's, that's good advice. That's good advice. Hey, Scott. Constantine had Scott? a also in yes, Palestine and so did the Romans after the uh, destruction of the temple. And the Romans introdu introduction of that was to rebrand the Judea and uh, Samaria as a Palestine, right? as an insult. As an insult, in other words, we're not going to recognize you uh, Jewish people anymore. We're going to basically say, y'all are history, now it's Palestine. And that was one of the conquering nations that uh, was used. So do your research. We, there's no map about Palestine after the Philistines. You can, you can find a lot on the Philistines. But you can't you can't put Palestine on a map until long after Jesus, you know. Uh, oh, agreed. And then oh. and there was a uh, a partition by Constantine into three territories, one of which was a Palestine Palestine A. So uh, just be very careful adopting the words of the. Uh, of the of the enemy of Israel. So, Collins, actually, you Enough raised a very friend. good fundamental. Uh, I, I watched you. No, 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 because because. So technically, you're right. So technically, it would have been called Judea, at 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 the time that we're discussing right now. I use and 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 again, I shouldn't use and I won't use it anymore. I use, I use it just as a contemporary reference of the area because everyone knows pa the Palestinian Palestine area now. And that's why I use it. I shouldn't. And I actually should know better because one of the things that I teach are distinctions and definitions are extremely important. So you just called out an important distinction that's very important. So the technical term, matter of fact, on this map I have right here in red, it is named Judea. So that's the correct term. Thanks. Thank you, Collins. But I just, again, I, I guess I've gotten lazy in calling it Palestine. You're very lazy. <laughs> because Scott, Palestine... can I ask you a question? Sure, I'm sitting here ahead. looking at this map, and there's a little white section due north of Cyprus. You see Cyprus in the Mediterranean? Yep. 
that white thing, I just Googled present day Western Europe and that's Austria. Why is Austria white like the Mediterranean Sea? Wait, I'm looking at the map. I don't see Austria as, as white. It's well, OK, put your put your take, take take your. Can you take your mouse and put it north of Cyprus? That's another sea. sea. No, no, due north, due north. Keep what is that? That's not a sea. I just looked at it. I just looked at it. It's Austria. What? No. Keep going. Keep going. Up oh, a no. white thing. Keep going due north. Take your that's, mouse. Go Cyprus to due north, where it's white. Uh, that's Galatia. That's uh, uh, that's a sea. That's the black. That's sea. a black sea. Black sea, I think. It's a black Austria. sea, but that's a big. That's a Austria big white. Austria's going to be Actually, over north of um, Italy. So, whichever Cyprus is 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 right next to close to Judea, right? <laughs> at this time, so if you go straight up, yeah, that's the Black Sea, right? Okay, got okay. it. Okay, okay. Uh, I very, was looking at current day. Yeah. You got me very scared very, there. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Barry has been trying to to uh, be to get right. in. Do you, yeah. Barry? Yeah. yeah we had closing comment. As you, I've been reading. I've been studying. The, and teaching the book of Acts, the one thing you notice that is, is very apparent, but people don't see it, that is that ev almost every page in the book of Acts, the theme is evangelism and discipleship. We don't live that way anymore. No, we lost no. that gift. So again, I wish I would have known, and Collins can appreciate this, going back and reading the soliloquies and the defenses and the arguments that Paul and Stephen make and others. I said, oh my gosh, they were like the best attorneys of their day. I mean, it, it's just the the logic and the historical threading that they use in their in their debates and their arguments are, are are just fantastic. I mean, Stevens. Remember, Stephen was a Stephen was a Greek Gentile. Stephen was a Greek Gentile. And look at the, the offense he puts on. And he actually brings out this incredible theology of the difference between the Mosaic Covenant and this new covenant, that even the teachers of the law and the scribes and the Pharisees and such, these guys were the, you know, the, the Charles MacArthur's of their day. And they didn't get it. And this Greek Gentile, this humble Greek Gentile comes in and schools them and schools them on the correct reason why Jesus Christ came. Uh, to me, that's just mind-blowing, mind-blowing. Um, and remember, a, a little biblical trivia tidbit. Stephen was full of what? Grace. Stephen was full of grace. Very, very few very, very few people in the Bible are accorded or named full of grace. Now, we can get into, I'm really getting off tangent, but biblical translations, one of the reasons the NSAB comes on hard against other translations is because, talk about grace, in Luke chapter 2, is Mary full of grace? That's a complete corruption of the Latin translation or the Vulgate. And no, she was highly favored, not full of grace. And that's where you get into a debate with your Catholic friends. Let's not go there. But that's one of the bones to pick among translations that we see in the Bible is the usage of grace with Mary versus highly favored. Now, there is no contention when we actually exegete the section of Stevens's defense and the translation of that Greek term, phraseology and grammar, that he was indeed full of grace. Anyway, um, all right, guys, any more questions, comments? I, I, right. found, the, I found this map on the Internet. Okay. 117 uh, AD. I found it. And well, I can't read this. I can't read any of the words, but I can read it on the yeah. So so thank actually you, uh, thank you everybody well, else. So one of the reasons I had this map it goes back to Collins, um, Collins warning, which thank you, is that does have the correct nomenclature 
the correct historical names of those sections that we see. Um, so that's just some food for thought. And thanks, Collins, for that, because you are right. Using Palestine is not accurate during that time frame. It's Judea. It's Judea. All right. All right, guys. So next week we start with Peter. Thank you. Yep.